Hello and welcome to the AV Forums podcast, streaming live on Sunday the 28th of June. It's the end of the month. And joining me for this edition, Steve Weathers. It's probing time. Ed Selly. It's not fat, it's power. Kaz Harlow. Sometimes you just gotta roll the dice. And tonight we're introducing Tom Davies. Nerds, am I right? Yeah. Now, Tom, is it Davies, Davis, or Davies? We'll go with Davis. Davis. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I only ask that because I used to have a girlfriend with that sub name and I, I never pronounced it right. Their film is it was a bit like. Oh, she dubbed bucket. you, wasn't it? Yeah, well, it was a bit like Bucket and Bouquet. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> they had a very strange way of saying Davies. So there you go. Uh, but anyway, we're streaming once again. Uh, welcome along, Tom. Tom's uh, first podcast. So we're going to treat him gently tonight well it depends on what he says about us uh, as the podcast goes on and how much whiskey he has to drink but uh, tom is joining us for the first time tonight we're streaming live but also remember we are here uh, indefinitely uh, on the audio playback so you can listen oh, to us or you can watch us um once we finish tonight it will be on youtube and it should be up on the uh, on your podcast service whether that's itunes spotify or any of the other providers uh, the audio version should be up there as well by about midnight tonight or maybe early morning. It just depends how quickly we turn that around. Uh, we also have a Q&A, uh, as we always do uh, on the video podcast, and uh, we'll cover your hardware, movie, and music questions uh, later in the show. So if you have questions, then please uh, do send them in. Um, we can see the chat box there. Good evening, everybody that's joining us on the main chat window. It's the usual characters, which is nice to see. It's always nice to see you coming back. <laughs> it's like cheers. Every Sunday. Um and it is the end of the month, so we have Ed's albums, playlist, and vinyl. Plus, we'll also have our favourite movies, discs, and TV shows to discuss this evening. We are aiming for an hour and a half, uh, so you can run you can run a book now if you want in the chat. See if we manage to hit our run <laughs> run time this evening. Uh, and also, you can, of course. Uh, Send a donation. If you send a donation, you're more likely to get your question answered because we are a bit mean like that on this. We're not joking. Uh, we do have our Patreon campaign, which is patreon.com AV forums. Uh, if you want to automatically support us, uh, that's three pounds a month. You can head over there and sign up. Or if you just feel like giving us uh, just a one-off donation because you are enjoying the show or you want a question asked or any of those reasons or you just want to support us, uh, you can do that via streamlabs.com forward slash AV forums. Um, and of course, by doing that, by supporting us, you do help us in growing AV forums, improving the site speed and features. Uh, we can produce more editorial, more content like this, news and reviews, podcasts, better videos, maybe even better podcasts at some point <laughs> down the line. You never know. Uh, but thank you very much. Places with someone <laughs> better. But thank you very much for your support. And those people that have been supporting us uh, over the last few weeks and so on, your name should be appearing up on the screen at some point tonight. And a very big thank you to you. So, before we get stuck into the best of the month, we've got current competitions, and Kaz is going to tell us all about those. Yep, so you can uh, win a copy of The Invisible Man on 4K. That closes 28th of July. Great win film, a copy great of... disc. It is, uh, although I think my question on is posing some troubles. It's a bit of a trick question, so apologies for that. <laughs> it hasn't caught too many people out. I can see a few incorrect answers, so you might have to think a little carefully before answering. Uh, win a copy of Criss Cross on Blu-ray, that closes 21st of July. Win a copy of The Last Waltz on Blu-ray, that's 14th of July. Greed on Blu-ray is also 14th of July. Flax Season 2 on DVD is 30th of June. Uh, Sonic the Hedgehog on Blu-ray is 7th of July. Uh, Beautiful Day in the Neighbourhood is 7th of July. And Criterion's June titles, Husbands, Dance Girl Dance and Scorsese Shorts, they're all on Blu-ray, that closes 7th of July as well. Uh, you can win a copy of Laughter on Paradise on Blu-ray. That closes 21st of July. And then there's the podcast special, which is you can win a copy of Eureka's Masters of Cinema release of A Foreign Affair on Blu-ray. In order to enter this competition, you'll need to use the following question to pick the correct answer. Which of these A Foreign Affair stars was also in Shane? A link to the competition is in the description. The competition closes Thursday. Good luck. All competitions are open to el eligible AV forums members resident in the UK. Previous competition winners, we've got Foster1984, who won a copy of 1917 on Blu-ray. Okay, so there you go. Uh, that's all our competitions up there. Are plenty for you to win. Uh, of course, you can find those uh, on AV forums. Uh, 
they are quite obvious to find, but if you're struggling, either use the menu or you can find them on the right-hand panel on the home page, at least. Uh, you should be able to see this. It says competitions in big letters, so you should be able to find it. Right, so what have we done this week? It's been uh, an incredibly hot week. Uh, we had two days where um, I, I never felt cool at once, at any time, um, which is kind of difficult. Tell you, Phil, how I knew it was hot. In, in normally in my cottage is very cool, um, even when it's a hot day, but it was not cool. But also, and this was telling, I put on a film and the projector's fan was much noisier than normal. And that's yeah. pretty sure that's because the temperature was so much higher in the home cinema. Yeah, well, I gave up on the, because uh, I've got the Lingdorf in the MP40 for review, set it all up on Monday when it arrived, because I'm excited to use it. I'm, uh, you know, brand Did new. Did you get bit it to 100%? <laughs> Uh, I got it to ninety seven percent. Oh, should have kept going. <laughs> um, it was it was really late at night, so it got to about midnight, and I was just wanting to hear what the end result was going to be like uh, for that. So, I uh, I rushed that through and listened to it, and then I thought, yeah, I'll get a couple of videos, a uh, couple of films watched, you know, this week. No, not with the heat, uh, not in that room, not with a projector running. And um, I'll tell you what, I don't know what the MP sixty is like, Steve, but the MP forty doesn't half chuck out some heat. Um, so, yeah, really, because uh, the I, I never noticed the MP60 getting hot. Yes, yeah, because apparently right. you live in a fridge. <laughs> well, that might be true. Um, there's no yeah, fan I... in it, so I guess it has to radiate the heat somehow. Yeah, well, there's no fan because obviously you don't want fan noise, which is good. Noise, uh, yeah, which you, is good. you know, you don't, I don't mind a, a bit of heat as long as there's no fan noise. Yeah, and I left plenty of room between that and the yeah. Yamaha 11 channel that I'm using to, to power the speakers at the minute. So, I think it was just the heat. In the house, Were you two not blind from, from pollen anyway? I am almost blind tonight. I'm struggling to read what's on screen at the minute. Um, yeah, Actually, I'm all right now. It seems like I had my worst uh, hay fever a few weeks ago when I missed that, when I couldn't do that, that um, podcast. No, it's, so. I think it's different types of pollen, Steve, because yeah, when, yeah. when you're really bad, I'm normally okay. And then, uh, you know, maybe a week later, and I think, obviously, you live in the south, I live up north. It probably takes about a week for <laughs> for things to move up north, you know, during the, during the spring and so on. So... I, I tend to get it a bit later than you, but oh boy, I've had it bad this week, and I've, I've been overdosing on the uh, Benadryls. You're only supposed to take one a day. I've been taking three or four, and still doesn't do any good. So <laughs> it's, 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 not, it's not exactly fear and loathing <laughs> in Las Vegas, is it? No, cool. no, but I, I have been feeling a bit drowsy, so uh, yeah. I haven't been. Are you operating any heavy machinery? <laughs> no, <laughs> just that mic. <laughs> just AV forums. Uh, right. So, what you've been doing this week, Steve? Well. Um... Uh, apart from enjoying the weather, I, I've been mourning the passing of the great Joel Schumacher, who uh, passed away this week at the age of 80. Um, interesting man, I have to say. If you've read anything about him, started off um, as a costume designer, uh, was flamboyantly gay, which shouldn't come as a massive surprise if you've ever seen him being interviewed, claimed he slept with 20,000 men, uh, which is good going. It, it, he died at 80, so it, it, let's give him the benefit of doubt and say he started at 20. That's Basically, a, a guy a day for nearly sixty years. I've got um, some catching up to do. So uh, yeah, I'm amazed. He, I'm assuming he died of exhaustion. To be honest. Um, yeah, started off as a costume designer. He wrote The Wiz, which is interesting for two reasons. One, uh, I thought that um, L. Frank Baum wrote The Wizard of Oz, and two, is a film that all stage plays is famous for having an all black cast. You'd think they would have got a black writer to write it, uh, but he did that. Then, of course, he became a director, and he's actually directed. I mean. He's directed some stinkers. Let's not. Let's be fair here. <laughs> the 1990s. I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> Batman and Robin Schumacher. obviously is the springs to mind. Although I tell you what, even though Batman and Robin is awful, it's worth buying the box set of the of the movies, the Batman movies from the 80s, because his commentary track on it is pure gold. He starts off by apologising for the film and then explains <laughs> why it all went wrong. <laughs> and it is worth a listen. And you can't help but like the guy when he says, I want to apologise up front for this film. Um, it's all my fault. I was a director. <laughs> is he, is uh, he, was he the one that did the Clooney nipple costume? Yes. 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 All right, fair enough. Yes, just yes. he put context. nipples on the Batsuit, which is probably what he'd be most famous for. That's he put nipples 20, on all the male superheroes and none of the female superheroes. <laughs> he also liked his crotch shots and his bum shots too, every now and then. <laughs> Don't we all? Um, yeah, it's, it's not a massive surprise to discover that he was gay when you watch Batman forever <laughs> uh, but he did some I mean he's done some of my favourite films I love I mean these are films obviously I loved as a teenager but St Elmo's Fire and The Lost Boys were two of yeah. my favourites Lost and Boys Flatliners, Flatliners. Yeah. the original Flatliners, Flatliners. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Falling Down yeah. Falling Down's actually a yes. bit of a yeah. classic I hate Hill. Falling Down I really hate really? that film 
It's yeah. a brilliant film. I think I think it's so light bad. Show. I would say oh, Prescient for today's times more than anything. Yeah. Uh, time to kill. That was yeah. pretty good. I, I kill. think. I think the thing with Fallen Down is it, he's a hard character to like. I think, and I think that you either you either go with it or you disconnect. But yeah, yeah at the end he realizes that that he's it. become the bad guy. That's the that's the beauty of the film. You know, I'm the yeah. bad guy. Yeah, I think it's because everybody else in the picture is so kind of, uh, I don't know. I guess two dimensional. You, there are there are moments in that film where you think like, am I supposed to be siding with him or not i mean you're not but there are moments where it becomes a bit ambiguous and i just felt a bit well i think oh, we can all appreciate getting yuckies. pushed too far yeah. and losing our rag yeah so but, but being pushed too far by traffic is a bit like yeah i don't know I've there's, a, there's a name for it now isn't it? it did they not call them karens now is that not you know if you, oh, really? you want to you want to speak to the manager or you've got a oh, complaint yeah, or, yeah. Yeah, so anything else, Steve? I mean, obviously, it's sad uh, to, to lose Joel. Yeah, and uh, I was, um, I've been testing, uh, well, yet more sound bars, obviously. Um, I've had two, actually. Uh, I've had the Samsung HWQ800T and the LG SN7CY. Uh, the latter really, really is... Catchy, uh, really catchy names. Oh, they, they are brilliant. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sound yeah. Bars. It must be Tripping said. off the tongue. Tripping off it's the perfect tongue. perfect for uh, a child's name. <laughs> <laughs> The uh, yeah. LG soundbar it ties in nicely with the fact that they just announced um, their lineup and pricing for all their soundbars. Um, the SN7, the SN7CY is uh, a single a single unit soundbar, so just a soundbar, no sub included. Uh, does 3.0.2, I guess, is the best way of describing it. So three forward tri firing channels, two firing channels. Uh, as a soundbar, it's perfectly good. It, it sounds very good. Obviously, you need to understand there are certain compromises being made here. There's no sub, so there's no bass, really. Uh, and there's no surround, there's no rear channels. Um, and so your uh, your effect is very much, like I was talking about last week, very much in the uh, front third of the room. Also, and this is just petty on the part of LG, but they still refuse to pass HDR10+. Plus. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, there is no reason for that other than just being petty. I mean, you know, Samsung happily passes Dolby Vision and HDR10+, Plus on their soundbars, and they don't even support Dolby Vision, but they know that... If, People buying the soundbar may not have a, uh, you know, a, uh, a Samsung TV or might have, a, say, a Panasonic and a Panasonic player and they'd want to pass both. Uh, LG just being pig-headed here, to be perfectly honest. And it's it's crazy because I think if you're, a, if you're an AV4 listener, you're looking at, say, the SN11, which is uh, their flagship model, um, which introduces, um, unlike last year, they've added in wireless rear speakers. So this is a direct competitor to the Q90 from Samsung. Um, you know, it would do. It would tick every single box, bar one. And if you've got, say, for example, a Panasonic TV and a Panasonic player, and you want to pass both Dolby Vision and HDR10+, you can't. Uh, so I think that's a bit silly on their part. Um, but but then LG on the TVs this year, uh, they've dropped DTS decoding. So you know, you, anything you put through the TV that's got DTS, it, it won't decode it. Uh, so if you've got a media player, um, because if you've got a display or whatever, you just you know, send it through PCM, you should be okay. Um, but if you've got a media file that you want to play that's DTS only, it's, they're going to play it. It's amazing, isn't it? Because you think, oh, we've got EARC, so you can pass lossless audio. Yeah, just as long as it's not DTS. <laughs> <laughs> you're right with that, Moss, but <laughs> DTS, you're screwed. Uh, it's, it's, they've made some strange, I think we said this last week, but they've made some strange decisions this year. Uh, anyway, soundbar wise, though, um, the uh, SN7, which is the one I've had in so far, um, as I say, it, it's, a, it's a good little soundbar. Uh, it's 399 quid. Sounds great, but be aware that, you know, if you're going for a single unit like that with no subwoofer, you're not going to have much, you're not going to have any real bass. And um, obviously, it's going to be front, very front heavy. Yeah, but I've, I found that, uh, obviously, I've been living with the uh, uh, HZ 1500 from Panasonic before it goes back. It's going back on Wednesday. I'm, sw I'm getting it swapped for a 2000 on Wednesday. So I'm looking forward to that coming in. But I've been living with it this week and obviously watching the football, which is in Dolby Atmos and, and so on. And obviously the 1500 this year, for those that are not aware, uh, only the 2000 last year had the Atmos speakers built in. The, the, that has come down to the 1500 this year. So it has the sound bar at the bottom of the TV and it has upward firing speakers at the top of the TV, which fire up and bounce off the off your ceiling. But there are no rear speakers. So what you find is, yeah, it sounds spacious at the front and a nice sound stage. And of course, you can switch the headphone uh, output to subwoofer output, and then you can adjust your crossover point and so on, which Panasonic are they still the only manufacturer, I think, that allow you to do crossover and everything within the TV as well. Yeah, so I've had sure. a, 
I've had a BK sub um, wired up to it as well. Sounds great, sounds fantastic. But like you say, Steve, very, very front heavy uh, in terms of sound stage. You know, don't expect any surround effects coming from uh, the rears and so on because we ain't got any rear speakers, which I'm still waiting for uh, a, a TV that comes with wireless rear speakers. Uh, bound to come yeah. at some point. If you go yeah, back to the little CR- CRT days, I think Toshiba used to do ProLogic TVs, didn't they, if I remember right? Wired, wired, wired rear speakers. speakers. Wired rear speakers, wired, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I'm sure they'll come around to it at some point. Uh, so the LG soundbar review is going to be up when, Steve, do you think? Uh, do I have the copy well, for that yet? No, not yet, but you'll have it this week. So I guess it'll right. never you okay. decide to put it up. <laughs> okay, well, it might be this week then. Or it might not. We'll, so. we'll, see, we'll, see. <laughs> we'll see if I'm as good as my word, shall we? <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, or if I pull an ed. <laughs> I'm on schedule what? this uh, month-ish. Are you? Okay. <laughs> Hang on, like a, that was a bit, that ish is carrying a lot there. It's, <laughs> so, okay, it's a structural ish, I grant you, but we're mostly on time at the minute. So so, so that'll be a Tuesday upload, is it, Ed? Yeah, that's the plan. <laughs> okay. Midnight okay. on Tuesday, I suppose. Yeah, no, it's always, no, <laughs> when, when I put things into the database, it's always put in for 23.59 on the end of the month, <laughs> uh, because it's the whole, the whole of the month, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Kaz, I believe there's some congratulations in order. Yeah, I became an uncle. I'm old now. Hooray. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, do, you've do, already do, got do children, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah, but it's, you get really old when you become an uncle. You're not necessarily you? old when you have children, but when you, when people start no. calling you uncle. Oh, you I've, be I've been 10 years old and be an uncle. No, my, an dad, uncle my, my father was an uncle at three. In fairness, there you go. a very lopsided and, family. And let's, let's face it, you don't do any work to gain the title anyway, do you? So. No, no, that's that's true. It's odd. It's odd. It all happening in lockdown as well, because it's very different from when my two were born. We had lots of family coming to visit, and obviously, it's harder to to accomplish all of that in lockdown. But uh, but yeah, I became an uncle. So, Congratulations, uh, well done. Thank you. Yeah, yeah so, so it's yeah. we've been also planning our first holiday in lockdown, which has been interesting You're after going seeing to the photos. Bed. Yeah, good. No, well, we were good. <laughs> We were going to go to Bournemouth, but, <laughs> but yeah. it looks like you and everybody else. Yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we couldn't get a spare centimetre there, so uh, it's not going to be Bournemouth. Um, we're looking at Wales, but apparently we can't go to Wales. No, they're, they, they're still super locked uh, down. Yeah, so I think um, that's to prevent them from escaping, if I'm honest. But, well, yeah. I, I still haven't seen my family since the end of February, so it is starting to great now, but I understand that I think from the 3rd of July... Yeah. Um, they're lifting the travel restrictions, so at least in July I should be able to get up. But yeah, I haven't seen my seen my parents since February. That's unless yeah, Scotland so. closes the borders, which apparently they're discussing at the moment. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not being facetious here. It's in today's news that mm. as they yes, haven't had I, a COVID. I read. Death, I read that, but they'll they'll have trouble doing that. I yeah. suspect they will yeah. too. Yeah, it'd be yeah. like that. What that terrible quarantining film. Quarantining Leicester and shutting off Scotland. <laughs> they could put the wall back up, I suppose, couldn't they? Hadrian's Wall. Then that'd be a trick. Yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll be, but actually... it'll be in reverse. It'll be the Scots putting the wall up instead of the English. Rams yeah. in this case. Yeah. Stop the White Walkers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so I've been looking at holidays, uh, and I've been looking at the interesting fallout of the spikes in the US because I found it quite oh. an interesting effect because this is all tenant related. Um, I mean, we're all wondering whether the cinemas are going to reopen. And the cinemas want to show movies, obviously, and they want to show good movies to get people back in. And Tenet is the one that everyone's been talking about for forever. Um, But the decisions recently, because of the spikes in L.A. and New York, I mean, Como has said he's delaying, deferring the opening of cinemas, I think, in New York. And as a result of that, almost directly, they've already pushed Tenet back to August. Uh, and as a result of that, nowhere in the whole world is going to get tenant. So it makes you mean... wonder what's going to happen over here because yeah. they're they going to open them. Yeah, the the plan is still to do it. Yeah. What is it the end of next week? Yeah, and tenth, tenth, what? What are and they're saying tenth, tenth, tenth of July for right. um, and they're saying for audience. no masks supposedly. Yeah. One meter. No, no films either for that matter. No films. Well, that's yeah. it. Well, like they're Empire opening everything. Back, right? well, what are they going to show? Yeah, I had Empire Strikes Back, and there's a film called Ride Like a Girl, which I think is coming to, to cinemas. That I'm sure I was offered the chance yeah, to review. Well, I've, had, uh, I've had issues this week because obviously they announced the 10th. Um, so I went into my Odin account, couldn't get in, kept saying my password and, and so on was wrong. Um, 
So then I checked my emails and so on, haven't had anything through. So I thought, well, uh, it sounds like they're trying to stop you getting in touch because the uh, uh, they obviously <laughs> they, they want to get the unlimited up and running again, don't they? And of course, my my limitless card is still running. So I've sent them two emails this week, pointing out that I am stopping my direct debit and they are to cancel my account because I am well over the the year that you have to do and and so on. Heard nothing, absolutely nothing from them. So. Um, so they're either really, really short, short staffed and gearing up to open, or um, I, I think it's more likely they're going to try and get at least one month's limit list. Payments out. are all over the place at the moment. I still haven't paid a penny other than uh, a, an initial early deposit for my car yet. I've been bombing around in it for nearly a month. And they haven't asked for any money at all. So that's very yeah, peculiar. Don't don't remind them. Well, I won't be. No, I mean, you definitely I don't say it on live podcast. <laughs> no, no, no. no I'm, I'm, to be honest, I'm ready. I am quite willing to pay for it. I just surprised. They said we'll take a first payment in four, in ten to fourteen days, and we're well, day twenty something now. So it, it, you say that, but actually, I was looking at. Um, I had I had to look at the Ford site the other day, and they are saying if you buy a car from them now, on their finance, yeah, uh, you get. Uh, I think it's three or four months payment holiday. Before you even start your well, your that's contract. great. Except I, I'd, I'd actually rather just start paying for it. Yeah, so I'm, I I'm the same. Finish in a timely fashion and move yeah. on, and not have the, the the hassle that's gone in thanks to lockdown on this one. But no, Ford, I do think the listening. payments for, for all sorts of things are all over the place at the moment. Yeah, well, I mean, unfortunately, uh, there are no um, major Ford dealers now in the northeast. They're closing everything down. Oh, um, and I think they're doing it countrywide. I think they're getting rid of fifty uh, percent of their dealer network. So, so things aren't that rosy out there at the minute no. so uh, so yeah uh yeah phil singh says my cinema my membership was put in hold for three months yeah mine's the same i haven't paid for it since they closed in march and um, they haven't been taking the payments but when they mentioned they were opening again on the 10th i reminded myself that i don't really want to be going to the cinema so i ain't paying for a limitless card if i'm, I'm not gonna so eat. glad i cancelled mine in december <laughs> yeah i mean if you know depending on how things go and all the rest of it uh, as soon as it's safe to do so, I will get my limitless card again because I love my my midweek trip to the cinema during the day when nobody else is there and so on. But not at the minute. Not not happy with that at the minute. Yeah, so uh, I can't see who's gonna. I mean, without a major release like Tenet or um, Wonder Woman or Bond, I can't, they're not going to get people back in with Empire Strikes Back. I'm going. No. <laughs> You're going. I'll go. <laughs> just just you. Yeah, but, I mean, well, the, in, in the, the staff there's a... that's involved in in manning the cinema and getting it all up and running and showing these films just for Tom, I mean, it's going to be a little bit excessive. Yeah, that sounds right. It'd be like having staff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'd be, yeah. It's like Downton Abbey be... for Tom. Is anyone going to offer to drive me there as well? That would be really great. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I guess they have to look at it and, and see, well, is it worth paying to have staff and to have the, yeah. the facilities up and running and obviously the electric bills are running and everything and, you know, the whole running cost, is it going to be worth their while if they're not getting any ticket sales through or are the film studios going to subsidise some of that cost and, and so on? It's, it's a bit of a strange one. Yeah, and there's no favorite big sales. I, I, no, there isn't. I, I'm not joking. Pick and mix won't be part of no, the. Well, no, no. Obviously, no. who wants to pick and mix in the middle of a yeah. pandemic? Yeah. I'll tell you what, my favorite COVID cinema related story is is that uh, I think last week, you know, last week, um, or week before, there was these, these people made this movie. I think it's called something like Unfriend or something like that. It was entirely shot, you know, it was, it was Zoom. It was done on Zoom. It's a movie. It's 80, at least 84 minutes long. So it qualifies as a feature film. They did it on Zoom. So it cost literally nothing. They then rented out a cinema for the night, brought all their friends round. And because of that, they were the number one film in the US that week. <laughs> Genius. Yeah. And, and I suppose best 10 grand they ever spent. And I suppose that, that'll now qualify them. Oh, or yeah. does it have to run for a seven days, doesn't it? But it's, if no, they're no, running no, for seven days, that, but they qualify uh, them for the Oscars. Forever now, in the record books, it will say that week yeah. in the US, the number one film was brilliant. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. <laughs> Good stuff. Uh, right, so who have we, who have we done? So we've done cars, we've done Steve. Tom, uh, welcome to the podcast. For people that don't know who you are, maybe you could explain who you are and what you do. Yeah, I'm a 10-year-old boy. I go to Springfield Elementary. I like to get up to hijinks. Uh, I've got a dog. Um, I've confused myself with Bart Simpson. 
Well, you see, it happens. Uh, <laughs> uh, you've obviously thought you're coming on ITN or BBC tonight because you placed yourself conveniently in front of your book stand, which everybody does at the minute yeah. when it when they say we're going to his home address. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting book stand. Uh, so obviously you've been doing movie reviews. You haven't been do doing movie reviews for very long, though, have you? I haven't. I literally started this year with uh, AV forums. Um, when was it? Was it the end of March? My word, have we not sent you some absolute chud in the meantime? So yeah, I've got to say yeah. though, I've got to say though, Tom's reviews are worth reading if it's absolute chud. Yeah, the, this the, the catch <laughs> is that you've done, you've done, you've painted yourself into a corner here because your best work is when you we inflict absolute dross on you well you don't know you don't know because no 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 unfortunately uh you <laughs> we are do know you are, you are it, your fury your fury is the uh is, is, is the uh is the is the guiding factor here and um yeah it's uh we need whoever whoever did the um uh that uh, appalling heist movie on netflix we basically need to get them to churn out one production a month for the sole purpose of getting getting you remember the name? it's olivia megaton oh yeah, yeah Mega, mr megaton <laughs> mm. is she related to the other megaton that made um, the, the taken optimus movies? prime <laughs> yeah he is he is the guy who made taken two and taken three and yeah. columbiana and pretty much every bad luke besson film but luke besson didn't direct and make bad himself <laughs> He's making yeah. some pretty bad ones on his own, really. Isn't yeah, he? he's he is. Done. He's done. Oh, he's done. He's been uh -huh. able to spring off on his own and do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's funny you should say that, Ed, because I look back at my Anna review, and after reviewing for like 15 years, uh, some some people clearly thought the best review I ever wrote was about a film I absolutely hated, which was both a compliment and a, what have I been doing reviewing good films for all well, these I mean, years? You know. <laughs> 20 odd years have been reviewing, nearly 20 odd years of reviewing. Ed, Steve, you're what, 10 years, 11 years? Yeah. Ed, you're what, around about the same? Yeah, so, 10, 12. The, like the thing is, the one thing you don't want is something that's middle of the road and okay. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Because that is the hardest thing to write anything yeah. about yeah. or to do a video about or whatever is if it's if it's an okay Another from, okay soundbar. You, you <laughs> either want it. Yeah. You either want something that is blindingly good and those are once in a blue moon. You maybe get one product a year that's like that. Um, uh, to be honest, you... weirdly, I've had two best in classes this month. Totally different categories, I stress. But <laughs> um, no, I've, it's really so that's weird. That's really, really rare. Uh, it, uh, it's been a very, a very surreal month for review products because one of them, I wasn't expecting anything. I was expecting it to be pretty good. I wasn't expecting it to do what it did. So, yeah, yeah that, that's all been quite exciting. But I agree, mediocrity is the enemy. It's the enemy of decent pros because yeah, we've it, we've had the we've had the feedback on the forum from um, the Eurovision movie I watched, which I think people think that I didn't like it. Like I thought that was fine. It was okay. Like it wasn't terrible, but it also was not good. But <laughs> I think because it's you gave just... it a five. I gave it a five. You gave it a five. How could you give it a five? It's not bad. It's not good. <laughs> That's a five. A five. <laughs> I can't How believe you gave you? it a five. five. <laughs> Got Will Ferrell in it. Why did you give it a five? <laughs> Everyone hates Will Ferrell. I don't hate Will Ferrell. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's it's one of those things. It's, I I hate it when that happens. Um, I'd much rather review a really really bad product, but then people. You know what? You don't really want to waste your time. No, you know, I, I, life, it, life is too short. Yeah, not least because unlike, I mean, I would, I would argue, possibly unfairly here, that the film reviewers only have to suffer that for the length of An time hour. that it runs An hour for. And a half, yeah. Whereas if I have to then thoroughly plow through something, which and usually when when we're talking about bad stuff with audio equipment in 2020, it, it usually just means it doesn't work properly. Yeah. So you then have to spend an indeterminate amount of time just arguing with it. Um, Ed, I see that, and I raise you ten hours of Netflix's Another Life season Cass, one. You're, hang on, Cass, you're in a no, different nobody, category um, altogether. But nobody forces you to do that, Cass. I had yeah. to. I had to see if it got better. I had to. <laughs> I owed it to people. <laughs> I actually watched my first bad HBO production, and I'm so in shock that I won't write a review until I see episode two. It's HBO's Perry Mason. The oh, first man. episode. What was, is the point of this? Oh my lord! Pretty Perry Mason reboot. No, it's Why? like uh, it's it's like someone was trying to do an impersonation of Chinatown, really bad one, and it's yep. so so bad. But I have to watch the second episode to see. <laughs> At if least this magic week you've got City wrong. of Angels starting. 
Yes. 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 Maybe well, we'll that know. might be good. Yes. <laughs> I don't know. He's, he's clearly hung up on Perry Mason. He's got I, I am a little bit. I'm a, I'm a bit disappointed well, if because the first a week episode ago, was rubbish. Why are you going to watch the second one? Just give because up. Because it's HBO, and uh, I, up until a week ago, I thought they could do no wrong. Well, and then my wife did remind me they did Sex and the City. But you know, I. I, I well, does does your wife do... not like Sex and the City? No, she was saying it in a positive way. I think. But anyway, I think I just used it. Listen, as the thing is, it. for the most part, my main fury at Sex and City was that it portrayed someone who wrote a column a week, living One in an enormous a week. Flat, <laughs> living in an enormous <laughs> flat in New York. It's like, no, I'm afraid that's not how it works. Yeah, but that was, that was kind of like that was kind of like Friends, though, as well. Though you know, they they were living in Manhattan, a big two big apartments, and where was the income coming from for that? What was a way for Friends? Wasn't it? Yeah, <laughs> one was out of work. One was a busker on the street. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, moving on. Um, what have we been up to this week? Well, uh, TV wise, just so you know, um, got a high sense U7 QN, a 55 inch, still in the box. Uh, also got a LG Nano 90, 65 inch. So that's the first Nano cell TV. I think we've looked at. You didn't look at one last year, did you, Steve? Because I certainly no. didn't. So this is the first Nano well, cell. I looked that we've one had the year before and then gave it a bad review, and they didn't send me any after that. Right. Well, I've got the Nano 90. Obviously, we're two years down the line. Uh, I have heard that the processing is a bit better. The you know local dimming and so on is a bit better on that. Still in the box at the minute, but uh, that'll be getting set up uh, this week as well uh, to be reviewing. Um, Sorry, I was going to say, is that like Showdringer's TV, isn't it? As long as it's in the box, it's good and bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just obviously I've been spending this week with the, uh, the HZ 1500 because people don't believe that he's actually sitting watching his TVs and think, you get a TV in for two days and then you write a review. No, you've got to spend some time with it. So I've actually been enjoying the, the HZ1500. I've got to say, it's it's my pick for one of the best all-round TVs. And if you're a movie lover, it's superb um, for, for movie watching. So it's so accurate out of the box. Uh, filmmaker mode is absolutely spot on with it. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a really, really good TV. And with the sound bar and the upward firing speakers as well, um, I think it really pushes the C10 because the C10's issue that we've discussed for a while now, if you're in the UK anyway, is uh, is the catch-up services and so on. So, yeah, the Panasonic, it doesn't have uh, Disney Plus, but is that a major loss? Because not a lot of people are actually signing up to Disney Plus. I have now watched pretty much every episode of The Simpsons up until the ones where it really just gets crap. So, yeah, I don't need any more. All day. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's a cracking TV, and I've got the HZ 2000 turning up on Wednesday, and that's a 65-inch. Um, so this is the 55, I've got a 65 turning up, which will be bloody heavy because it's got all the speakers and everything else. And like I mentioned earlier on, the Lingdorf MP40, I set that up on Monday. Uh, my one biggest complaint about it, Steve, at the moment is there's no Wi-Fi. No, you have you've got to, to connect it with a LAN cable. <laughs> you've got it, and I ain't got a long enough LAN cable to to be doing that. I mean, I, the, the the benefit of having a Sky system is that the Sky boxes all act as Wi-Fi hubs, so you've got excellent Wi-Fi throughout the the house, and I've got excellent Wi-Fi speed and all that. So, I've had to resort to using the Apple TV as my Spotify Connect device. Um, but the thing is, if it goes to sleep, it doesn't wake up and start playing. Just, so you use it, go just get an Ethernet wireless bridge. So, I mean, they're buttons. You, yeah, but that's like too much hassle. So how did you check the firmware updates and all that sort of stuff? Did you? Uh, I haven't done that yet. So um, I'm going to have to, you know, at some point wire it up and, and check for... By a longer cable. But it's a brand new product, Steve. So um, like I've got the first one, I think, that's landed in the UK with the, with the distributor. So um I, I don't expect there to be any firmware updates, but I will check it uh, as I go on. Well, I'm assuming the firmware should be the same as the firmware for the MP60. Well, it's basically well, the same device. Um, it so doesn't do as many channels. It's 12, just, is that right? Yeah, it's 12 right. channels oh, rather than 16. It. So, you know, it only does 12 channels. Um, it's only XLR, which is which is good because it's all balanced connections. Um, the only thing there was the subwoofers. I had to buy one of those X, XLR yeah, to <laughs> RCA, and I'm only running one, one subwoofer at the minute. I need to get another one to run uh, stereo subs and Actually, check that out. Actually, Martin so. Hamilton, he is entirely correct on this. You don't need to bother with anything so so complex as an Ethernet wireless bridge. Just get a power line adapter so you can take a, a you, an Ethernet out from your your hub, and then just you've, you, it yeah, means yeah. you permanently got an Ethernet socket in your. Yeah, in yeah. Your, I, I just, I just need to, I need to speak to Greg Hook because he's got all that stuff. So, because he gets it. He sort you a nice doorbell as well. 
<laughs> Probably. Um, Justin Lewis, uh, want there going to be a CX video? Yes, I am still making the video at the minute. Um, it's taking a little bit longer than I want. He's having to. difficulties with the car chase scene at the moment. So um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> no, it's just that we had some incredibly hot days, and to film the stuff, I have to wait and it getting dark. And he has otherwise, to be dressed, and he doesn't like that as well. Otherwise, I have to take 65-inch TVs all the way through into the cinema room. I don't have the room to move the camera and all that kind of thing. So I actually have to wait, on, and this is the wrong time of the year. Plus, it's roasting hot, so that's my excuses. I'm sticking to them. <laughs> uh, but anyway, back to the MP40. Uh, it's been too hot to, to really do anything in the cinema room, but I did listen to some Dolby Atmos music through uh, the Apple TV and uh, run uh, Room Perfect. And, yeah. Um, I, I really want to get stuck into it this week and do some film watching and so on. Um, uh, it's it's a fantastic piece of, of equipment. I did forget that you have to manually do all your distances and stuff, though, Steve. I'd forgotten that yeah. you had to do that. Well, the one there. thing you have to do is manually measure your distances. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so that was annoying. I had to get my tape measure out. And you know how awkward that is running. To, well, so. yes, laser, laser measure. <laughs> No, I haven't got a laser. Why would I have a laser measure? I'm not an installer. So much easier. <laughs> <laughs> and they cost about 10 quid on Amazon. That's Do they? All right. I'll, I'll go on wish.com and buy one on the other. Uh, yeah, I've so, got a wish one. It'll tell you that your speakers are four miles away. <laughs> <laughs> that's if it turns up. Or, yeah. or it'll turn up and it's a miniature little thing about this big. Uh, so anyway, that's what I'm looking at. And uh, loads to do. Uh, loads of stuff still coming in as well. Uh, expecting an Arcan processor in at some point as well. i well, been expecting that for a few months. But mm -hmm. hopefully that's getting a bit closer because Steve's had the AVR in. So if the AVR's out there in the world, then uh, hopefully the processor's not too far behind. Um, TCL have launched some TVs. Um, still yet to get one in for review. So TCL, please send us TVs for review. Um, is, is there a reason you're not doing that in the minute? Um, they've got IMAX enhanced certification. Not really I sure wonder what that means. <laughs> I, don't, I have no idea. I've read the press release about three times now, and it's... It, it's... I thought, I'm not a dig at TCL, it's more a dig at IMAX. Is, is I, 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 yeah, IMAX enhanced. Well, from the audio side, at least they're doing something with that because it's DTSX and it's, an, it's a little layer above um, that it unlocks if you've got an AVR that does IMAX enhanced. So I get that. For the video side, they go and it's a bit like how THX used to do the certification on the transfers of films. So they'll go in and, and they've invented some... Um, it's tech techniques, so it's noise reduction techniques and that kind of thing that they add in the uh, in the production of stuff. So anything that's released on disc is IMAX enhanced. that will have gone through this process and so on. So I understand that. But when it comes to TVs, and again, like Steve says, we're not really having a quick TCL. It's, uh, but Sony uh, are the other company that are, are, are on about yeah, it. Yeah. There's no IMAX enhanced picture mode or anything like that. So I do not understand what IMAX enhanced means other than it's a, it's a badge on the product, a bit like what THX was. But at least with THX, you actually got picture modes that were set to the standards. And it's a really cool looking badge. So I mean, it shouldn't matter. Well, back in the day, THX, you know, they would they would be involved in the development of a product. You know, the, the yep. components. It was it was very difficult. It used to be very difficult to get a THX. Well, but it's, it still is, and and they're testing. It wasn't you know bullshit either. I I've been to their testing facilities in Marnock yeah. County, and I've been in the testing rooms, and I've been there when they've been testing the equipment, and it is done correctly. Um, they have all the equipment to do it, and you know. You didn't get any leeway if you're a manufacturer, even though you were paying for the certification program. You didn't get any leeway. If the product didn't pass, it didn't pass, and you had to work on it to get it through. So, um, but but you only got a ridiculous, you got like a 15% discount on the fee to do it again. You didn't right. get much, much no, off. No, no. So, you had to have, you know, you had to actually follow the standards that they laid down. And the other thing is, THX won't tell you what those are if you're not a paying uh, manufacturer. Right. For a number of years, and I even said, look, you know, give me an NDA. If I mention it to anybody, you can find me for millions and all the rest. Just give me a hint, and they would never, ever do it. They would never release that that information. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure why Max Enhance. I really do not know, I, and I don't understand it, and I don't understand why they're making a big thing of it. Um, and, of course, those that are running IMAX Enhanced are not doing filmmaker mode in their TVs. So I don't know what the issue is there. But anyway, TCL, send us your TVs for review. I'm dying to see them, please, TCL. Get in touch and uh, and we'll review those. Um, LG Soundbar. So you've been looking at LG Soundbars, Steve, but they did announce um, the availability 
uh, for this year as well for the rest of the lineup. So uh, just remind us what those were again. Oh, hang on. I'm not looking at the Because <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's uh, the, what have we got? The SN, so the, well, there's loads of them, but um, the ones that are probably most of interest are the SN7CY, the one I was talking about earlier, which is 3999, 3999, uh, the SN9YG799, and then there's the flagship SN11RG, which is uh, 1499. Plus, there's the, this is probably of interest um, going back to the GX, the G10 review that we did earlier. There's now the soundbar for that, which is a thousand quid. So oh, it's oh, lovely, though. It's really nice. nice, though, Steve, when you see it with the TV. It, did, it blew me away when I saw it at CES. I just thought, wow, design-wise, that's absolutely, uh, it, is, it does look absolutely gorgeous. But a thousand quid's a bit. But then the TV's a bit toppy as well, isn't it, really, for the design? It ain't cheap. No, that's true. That is true. Um, there's, I just noticed there's, I don't know what the difference is. There's a, a SN7Y, which is going to be available on the 6th of July, for 500 quid and there's the SN7CY which is the one I've got which is 400 quid and available now don't know what the difference is okay well we'll find out because we are interested in our jobs aren't we Stephen you... <laughs> <laughs> sometimes not on a well, Sunday evening. get some enthusiasm going there uh, and Validine we haven't heard from Validine in a oh, I'm trying to remember the last Validine product we reviewed it was probably a digital drive subwoofer and it was probably when Russell Williams was still around doing our um, audio yeah, reviews, which, was. which would have been 400 years ago, seven at the years. edge of the Renaissance. Yeah, <laughs> seven or eight years ago at least. Seven or eight years ago. So I haven't, re I haven't really heard from Validine since then, really. So um, Redline are still distributing them in the UK. I've got a Validine sitting right next to me. It's a CHT10, I think. It's connected up to the Gen X on my PC system. Fantastic little subwoofers. And these are, uh, well, they're called micro V's, so they are little subwoofers. It's the Mark II version of it. And I've got to say, for uh, little powerful subwoofers, Validine know what they're doing. And they were one of the first brands. I think they were, uh, along with um, M&K, one of the first companies to ever release a subwoofer uh, for home theatre use. And certainly Validine were the first out the gates, if I remember correctly, with DSP uh, for running subwoofers. Now, everybody does DSP on the subwoofer, Steve. Um, but Validine was certainly one of the first in the digital drive series. They were pretty revolutionary at the time when they came out. And that was, like I say, eight, ten years ago, uh, the DD15, DD18. and I they do, came do, with, I uh, do remember spending some time with the DD18. That was, it was the, I mean, in the UK, it was the most unnecessarily powerful device in the menu. I mean, <laughs> unless, even once you put the DSP settings in, unless you basically ran it at kitten's breath, it would overload any space it was in except a hanger, but it was <laughs> hilarious. The other thing, I always had a huge amount of time for Velodyne is they were one of those companies that understood that every now and again, a little bit of showboating never does anyone any harm. I particularly like the fact that for a number of years you could order a, many of their subs with a transparent uh, uh, transparent lid, Jeez, yeah. So yeah. you could see, you could you could have a look you at all the guts on the inside yeah. of it, which you know it has a certain confidence in what was inside it, you know. Because if yeah, well, it's I mean, just, it's, you know, they moths, were one of the first companies to use uh, the servo assist with their yeah. uh, with their subwoofers and so on. So they they were a big big brand back in the day, and I'm sure they still are in the states. It's just we don't really hear much about them, sadly, in the UK. But it's good to see that they are bring some product in we'll speak to redline and we'll see if we can get that in for for review because they do some cracking little subwoofers and like i say the the, the gd18 back in the day i had a demonstration um with this it's um the the one with the drums steve um flying daggers or whatever oh, it is house of flying daggers house of flying daggers I had that demoed and every time it hit the drum you actually felt the impact on you you didn't hear it you actually felt it on your chest the the impact of it because it was just loading the room ridiculously so yeah good stuff there so like I say it's end of the month 
and uh, we're actually doing really well for time this week. So well, I'm going to ruin that now. Watch so. it go downhill very, very swiftly. Yeah. But Ed's uh, vinyl playlist and album of the month. And like I say, I always look forward to this because I always find new things to go and listen to. Well, but just before we do that, can I just say how delighted I am that we've had an art upgrade for the um, video thing this evening. So we've all got little icons next to our names. Yeah, so but I'm the only I've... one that's. I'm the only one that got the memo on being. Yeah, well, you, if you don't tell me what's going on, I'm not going to do it. But what I particularly like is that obviously my icon reflects, you know, Hi-Fi, the Luddite tendency. You've got a telly. Our two media reviewers have got media. It basically looks like Steve's an expert in soft furnishings. Um, yeah. And I've got a sofa. <laughs> yeah, Ted, that's on the sofa. <laughs> You know, Steve is here for all all your uh, all your footstool needs. Uh, right, yes. Uh, first of all, there is a quick news story. Uh, Bose and Wilkins. Uh, we still don't know anything further about the business of Sound United. That's gone very quiet. Uh, but they have announced signature versions of two of their seven hundred series loudspeakers. And um, now, I'm not going to lie, there was a really diligently assembled uh, online press conference for this, which I missed because I had my son that day and I was doing some homeschooling very badly. But nevertheless, I was homeschooling. So I didn't get to see all of that. So a lot of this is sort of regurgitated. But fundamentally, they're taking the uh, 705 and the 702, and they've just given them a solid going over. And it must be said, what looks like some very, very smart, um, some veneering work on the outside. Uh, Bowers and Wilkins signatures have been around for like 30 years now, on and off. Um, they're never a regular part of the range, and they don't always come along for a given price point generally speaking though some of the signature products they've done in the last 30 years have been amongst the best products I've ever made so high hopes for these and i thoroughly enjoyed the 705 as it as it was just as a stereo speaker and i believe that steve has played about with a complete 700 series multi-channel pack and he rather liked them as well so the omens are that this should be quite good um and needless to say if we can wrangle some review samples we'll do so i may even break the habit of a lifetime and look at the floor stander because i can actually get floor standers into this place because it's not a shed so um we'll see how we go from there but that was that was the sole sort of piece of uh hi-fi stuff going on this week so moving on to media uh album of the month is by a group of musicians they they hesitate to use the word the phrase band uh but they are called salt s-a-u-l-t uh they have released uh, a couple of albums in the past they've been active for about seven or eight years now my brother uh who is more switched on to these things, uh, gave me the nod on some of their work from a couple of years ago. This came out this month. Uh, it is called Untitled Brackets Black Is. Um, obviously, it ties into the entire uh, state of affairs that we find ourselves in, Black Lives Matter, all the rest. Uh, but nevertheless, please don't for a second assume that this is bandwagon jumping. They've been talking about these messages for the entire time that they have been um, producing music. And it is an organic part of what this album is. It's not, it's not, you know, shoehorned in. It doesn't feel stilted or unnatural. And I just think it's a magnificent listen. Um I'm really pleased that actually Stuart has taken my link directly on this, because if you see there, if you are interested in physically buying the album, you can see it's on Bandcamp. Um, You can uh, essentially, you know, if you are buying media under these circumstances, you're going direct basically to the artist. I mean, Bandcamp does take a small, a small percentage for hosting, although they waive that on a number of occasions, if you keep an eye on, on their social media feeds. Uh, So if you buy it that way, they get, the money Uh, and it's an absolutely spellbinding album um it isn't my vinyl release of the month simply because i wanted to talk about more than one album but i have no doubt in my mind given how well the actual album itself is mastered the vinyl release is likely to be extremely good as well vinyl release this month uh was supposed to be here by now and it's not so i'm still it's an article of faith uh this is an american artist called sarah jaros um uh this is her fifth album she's a multi-instrumentalist uh the album's called world on the ground uh again it's on all the major streaming services if you want to have a listen um it's 
singer songwriter stuff but there's a there's a bleakness there's an edge to it it's not just singing about you know niceness um and again she's a phenomenal musician really really exciting to listen to um all 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 of the instrumentation that you hear is largely done by her uh, so as well as singing it, you you know write the theme tune, sing the theme tune, that whole sort of business. So it is a very very good listen. A couple of other highlights from this month. I'll bring up my, my notepad. Um, uh, Ray Lamontagne, uh, after uh, three albums of releasing stuff that sounded like he'd fallen asleep listening to Pink Floyd and then woken up and had some funny ideas, uh, he's back doing more of the things that he got into being. Uh, known for in the first place. Uh, it's an album called Monovision. Very, very good. Uh, Bob Dylan released new content, which doesn't happen every day. I'm going to admit in public that I am not a huge fan of Bob Dylan. Sorry. Um, I particularly like the fact that there was a petition that his music should be moved on Apple to the podcast section because he just speaks. <laughs> um believe that as it may nevertheless obviously it's number one in the charts at the moment uh and he's the oldest artist to reach number one with new material so congratulations bob um another lady singer songwriter tenille towns she's good released an album called lemonade stand this defies easy description if i was to tell you it sounds like a nashville country and western album that was produced by air the french electronica band that sort of gets halfway to what it is. You'll either like it or hate it. I think it's absolutely brilliant. Uh, and then there's some uh, decent electronica as well. Um, there is uh, a um, an album by a group called Young Ejector uh, called Ride Lonesome. Uh, the cover's a bit racy, but uh, the album itself is very, very good. And then uh, there is uh, an artist called Arrow, uh, and she is uh, she's released an album called Novella. It sounds like uh, music for a film that hasn't been written yet. Really, really interesting um, set of productions. Uh, they're all on streaming services. Um, I checked. Every single one of these is available on any of the streaming services that I can access, which is all of them except Apple Music, and I can't believe for a second they're not on that as well. So do get stuck in, see what you think. Uh, playlist this month is from Tidal who accidentally produced something that's quite good. Um, I haven't got around to watching this yet because I don't turn my television on. It sort of sits there as a monolith on the wall without doing anything. <laughs> um, but uh, I know all of you lot have been very excited about this Last Dance thing on Netflix. Well, Tidal has accrued all of the music for soundtracking The Last Dance. And imaginatively, they've called it Soundtracking The Last Dance. So it should be easy enough to find. Uh, it's got some good tunes on it. So, yeah, if you enjoyed... The, if you enjoyed the basketball and you want to live it vicariously, um, get stuck into that. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed listening to it. I might even watch the program at some point this year. So can't say fairer than that. So those are the things. Thank you ever so much for um, the feedback on the uh, live album uh, list. Uh, even my feedback. Well, you can sod off. Um, Actually, I owe, I owe you a big thanks because I listened to uh, Dark Side of the Mule. It's good, and it? Absolutely love that. Although I'm thinking, did the people who went to that gig know they were going to spend half of it no, playing Pink no, Floyd absolutely, covers? No, no, the whole thing is when you go to Mule gigs, you don't know what they're going to do. Um, all that all that they would have known is that it wasn't it didn't tie into an album release. So it and and these these gigs have been legendary. They do one at least one a year where it's a, anything could happen. Yeah, because this was um, obviously a, a Halloween gig because I kept saying yeah. at the end something about thanks, happy Halloween. So yeah, it was amazing. Like for a whole half of the show, at least they did some really good Floyd covers. Yeah, and as I say, because they're not they and some deep dives too, like Fearless. That's not a well-known Floyd song. So no, it was, exactly. Uh, and if you um, if you uh, the the thing is, they weren't tied into like a laser show and it needing to be second by no, second. Yeah. So it just it grooves in a way that pulse. And some of the others just don't because they were too regimented. Mm. Um, uh, did you, I mean, I, had you listened to that public service broadcasting live one before? No, but I, I like public, yeah, that's also really good. Uh, so that's good. And Tom, you picked up on the, the LCD sound system one. I, oh, I man, absolutely that adore that. Farewell tour is just unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, obviously incredible. not a farewell tour. Which, no, which not anymore. Like, you know, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and people going, you missed this, missed that. I, I did mention this in an earlier podcast. And unfortunately, I can't bring the list up because it's on. I do. I have all sorts of things on Notepad. There's one in front of me at the moment on the screen. Um, and if my computer installs an update, it just bins it. 
But as I say, at one point, there were 118 live albums on the list. And much as I love you guys, I'm sorry, I'm not doing a list of 118. So it had to be whittled down. Well, you to... could have just done a list, I suppose. I could have done, but it would have then been a bit... You, you, could have done it, you could have done it as 50 to listen to on a Monday, 50 to listen to on a Tuesday. <laughs> well, if, you're, if you've got the budget for it, um, I probably still don't yeah, have you've the got time. The time. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, but, what, I have, what I will say is, though, in terms of in, interacting with the community and giving the community some some uh, uh, valuable input into what they should be listening to, I think it's gone. Uh, the both of the articles you've done recently yeah, have gone well, down incredibly we, well. I, so. I've got some I've got some ideas about how we turn this into something more of a group activity, which I'm going to try and work on. Oh God, who knows? Uh, soon. There will be another music article this this month. I'm not giving anything away on that one. Um, but thank you for the feedback. And yeah, uh, I mean, the thing is that there were lots of people saying that, I mean, essentially what boiled down to, there should have been more 70s and early 80s ones. The thing is, there were already a lot of 70s and early 80s ones on there. I did want to try and spread it out a little bit. And the other one, I'm sorry, is that um, I think like a heavy metal. <laughs> I'm not that. You may find this hard to believe, but I'm not that much of a metaler. Um, sorry. Uh, but no, equally, if you are looking for recommendations, people in the comments have made some blinding ones. So there's 50 albums in the article and at least another 50 brilliant ones just reading the comments. So if you are into live music, just get absolutely stuck in. If you are into live music as well, um, Depeche Mode put up another live album this month. I don't think it's as good as 101, the one that actually went into the list. But um, if you want some of their more recent stuff done, I mean, Dave Garn, considering the man's nearly died twice and he can't be that young anymore, he still puts puts the effort in. So, um, you know, good for him. So, yeah, loads and loads of decent music. Uh, and there was a question that cropped up. It had my name in it. And again, I stuck it on my notepad. All right. Well, they, well maybe you save that for a little bit later oh, on, because okay, I, think, I think we're musicked out at the minute, Ed. Oh. Um, but if you do find that interesting, if you found Ed's articles interesting, and you want to support us on the forums with our editorial and so on, don't forget you can make a donation. So patreon.com forward slash AV forums. Uh, if you want to uh, support us long term, that's £3 a month. Or if you just want to uh, donate directly just to once or you've got a question you want answered or whatever, uh, send us a donation through to streamlabs.com forward slash AV forums. Uh, and that's a perfect way to get your questions actually answered on, uh, on this podcast. And Steve, what else should they do? Don't forget to like and subscribe and hit that bell. Excellent. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, obviously, if you do like us um, and you like this video, it helps it climb up uh, the uh, the search facility on YouTube and it means that more people can find us and join in and join in with the community. So if you are watching at the moment, and I can see that there are plenty of you watching at the moment mm -hmm. and you're enjoying what you're seeing, then please hit that like button if you don't mind um, because it does help us, like I say, go up the uh, up the search results. Um, right, so uh, that's best of the month in terms of music. We need to head over and do some movie stuff because we've got two from the movie uh, team here this evening just to do end of the month stuff. Um, right, so let's start with the best movie of the month. And obviously we have to preface this with the fact that there are, there are no, no movies. new movies being released in the <laughs> cinema. So obviously these these are things that are popping up as uh, rentals and so on that the studios are not going to release and just putting straight to streaming. So, Cars, in terms of best movie of the month under those circumstances? Well, I think uh, Tom and I both agree that it should be the last days of American crime. <laughs> <laughs> loved it. Absolutely Two thumbs up it. right there. Did, did Tom have any uh, inclination that that's what you were going to say there? <laughs> or, were you, or are you just imposing your choice, aren't you? <laughs> it's the film that he absolutely slated. <laughs> <sighs> it's, it's one of the worst films you can watch this year, I suspect, judging yeah. from the yeah. review. Yeah, like. I think it's maybe one of the worst films I've watched in like the last five or ten years. Like, it was, oh, it was bad. That's good that you accomplished that, though. <laughs> it's, good, it's good that you pushed um, your limits. Not sticking about, um, you know. Yeah. I suppose, I suppose, out of films that we're looking at for the month, uh, one of the best ones I saw unexpected was The Vast of Night, mm -hmm. shot for seven hundred thousand dollars. I know it doesn't look great. I know it's got a simple plot. It was shot for seven hundred thousand bucks, and um, I quite like the dialogue. I, yeah, I, uh, I quite like the style. Yeah, it's like it's like an old. Twilight Zone movie, except um, not 
in obviously 4K. shot shot <laughs> yeah yeah in 4k <laughs> yeah. and uh, and movie length and it's um i enjoyed it uh, you, you have to go in well, with reasonable expectations it's Actually, really it's really sorry. tight in terms of like the the editing of it like so often now you'll go into a film and think like there's like 30 minutes here that we don't need i don't think that's the case at all well, with Bass yeah. of night at all i think like whoever whoever was in charge of trimming it down got it to the perfect length it was it was just right yeah I thought it was a, a, a very unexpected surprise for the month. Yeah. Um, but I have to say, I also, and I know it's a grungy B movie, I did also like Underwater. I think because everybody else hated it and it got slated <laughs> on cinematic being, release. Being I, like, I like people trapped underwater in tense situations. Yes, we're going to talk about The Abyss, Ed, um, and why it's still not on Blu-ray. I, I a... I'm just saying it. it it has to come in because we're talking about it basically. Uh, Tom, there's just been a very interesting question raised. Have you seen Cats? <laughs> no, God no. Right, so in no, other words, no, we, don't, no. we don't have the ultimate baseline for whether The Last Days of American Crime is potentially the worst film, so, you know, of, of 2020. the century. Oh, yeah, no, I, I couldn't comment on that. It was Last Days of American Crime, worst film I've seen. But, right. But, I I know I'm going to hate cats. I'm not going to watch it. I don't have to watch Kaz, it. I'm not going to watch it. Kaz, yeah. can you make sure Tom sees cats, please? Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I have to say I am. I'm. I'm I will watch it. But I'm, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for the butthole cut. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, have you got the yeah. 4K, Steve? <laughs> no, I, is it? I don't. Even, I'm, no, uh, no, no. I have not got it. <laughs> I don't think it's out, and I'm not going to get it. I would absolutely love it if it had a reference yeah. level soundtrack. Great video and audio, though. Yeah, it's really. <laughs> that isn't necessarily why, but I know I appreciate the hypocrisy of my statement in your live albums thing. But when it comes to live recordings and live shows, I don't care if the recording's crap because it's about the energy of the show and it's about the way they interpret the songs. Um, it's yes. less. It's more of an issue with the studio recording or with you know with the movie uh, or a disc. But um, but yeah, I, I, I've reached. I've realised now that you know, I'm pretty much only buying uh, really yeah. good catalogue. No, <laughs> things I really genuinely want because they're, they're catalogue yeah. titles that well, I really want. I've got to say, catalogue-wise and stuff that we've had through certainly this month, uh, when it, when it comes to best discs of the month, it's been really. Uh, I, I think we've been spoiled this month actually. Mm. When you actually look at what has been released, I mean. Far and away the best of them all for me, anyway, is Jaws, um, because that is my one of my all-time favourite films. It's probably in my top three. Um, I've seen that on every format it's ever been released on. Um, I think the the high point was the Blu-ray release from about four years ago, uh, when they did the original Wetgate scan at uh, 4K and so on. But this uh, this version where they have actually gone and regraded it. Um, done an HDR pass on it, Dolby Vision pass on it. Ah, it just looks absolutely amazing. For me, that is probably disc of, for so far disc of the year for me in terms of um, they absolutely nailed it. You, you, it's never looked as good as it has uh, on that disc. So for me, and even the Atmos makes now, you know, some purists will say, well, it should really be the mono track. Yeah, I've sat and, and Watch the mono track, and I know all this, all the sound cues from that. But it's the mono, the mono so, track's on the disc, isn't it? You can if you want to listen. Oh, to it I, I don't know if it is there or not on this no. release. I'm not sure. It might be on the Blu-ray. I don't know if it's on the 4K disc. But um, yeah, the disc, there's the slight differences. They have changed some of the sound effects for the Atmos. And if you're really familiar with the original mono soundtrack, you will notice a, um, a couple of of things. They've used some new stems for some effects and so on. But Overall, it's absolutely sumptuous. Um, if you haven't got in disc, go and buy it. Um, it it's grainy because it's supposed to be grainy. Because <laughs> that's one of the things I, on Facebook, I, one of the groups that I'm a, a member of is an 8K group or something like that. There, there's lots of these groups. But, yeah, I think I saw that comment and then it oh, blood. It was, it was like, really? You shouldn't be allowed to, a TV and a disc player if that's what you think. I mean, this guy was slating it and it's like, no, that is how it should look. Um, so, yeah, for me, that's my uh, disc of the the month, Steve. Uh, yeah, that would be mine too. I do. I did enjoy all three of the Tom Cruise movies. They got a release uh, as well. Um, Top Gun looks fantastic. Sounds amazing. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed Days of Thunder, which I'd never seen despite owning it on five different formats. And um, <laughs> and uh, I thought that uh, well, actually, 
War of the Worlds was a bit of a mixed bag. Picture-wise, absolutely stunning. Um, uh, stunning to look at. Um, the disc looks amazing. Atmos mix-wise, the Filter addition case. of the height channels, the addition to the height channels really gives extra height to the tripods because everything, you know, the film shot at ground level. It's got this post-9-11 vibe to it. You know, you're at street level, you're, it's seen from the perspective of the human beings. So that extra height works really well. But, yeah, the face is completely filtered out. Comparing it to the Blu-ray, it's a massive difference in terms of the base, which is a real shame. Yeah. I, I really otherwise, it, it would have been perfect. I really wish they would stop doing that. I, I mean, is Bill Hunton doing anything? Because he's got some great contacts uh, in the industry. Has he highlighted this in any way? Is there any push to, to get to stop it? All right. Okay. I can ask him. <laughs> I know so you've been chatting with Philip Bloom. Uh, yes, Phil's got. Well, he's got the uh, C10 in. For, yeah. No, no, it's a G10. Uh, he has got in for it. And he asked a question about filmmaker mode. And I think he was taking it for. Obviously, Phil Phil Bloom is a filmmaker. Um, he was taking it from the filmmaker point of view, and I, so I, I just gave him a quick message about what actually filmmaker mode is. Because um, it is quite funny that you know directors of photography they know what they're doing and so on, but they don't necessarily know the ins and outs that we do as nerds when it comes to calibration and so on so so yeah it's an interesting conversation there but uh but yeah if you could ask bill that that would be fantastic well, I think the film of the month would be defy blood oh, okay second okay. that was a okay. baller movie uh Is that discs a badge? <laughs> baller movie if it's not <laughs> bad it needs to be one yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll take yeah. that, in, yeah, we'll that, take that under consideration there yeah. Yeah. Uh, right so uh, where else have we gone yeah, um, Kaz discs for you because you get to see quite a few every month uh, yeah I'd probably I mean it's not going to go to uh, Bloodshot and uh, it's not going to go to Doolittle it's going to be uh, I didn't haven't picked up Jaws I think um, uh, I was. I, it went to Simon, so I was so bitter and jealous that I refused to buy it's it. Only, it's only 20 quid, Cass. I can't do it. I can't do it. it. You know, I'm so gutted and borderline depress depressed over it. No, I just haven't got around to watching it. So, um, so I can't comment on Jaws, but I know it sounds amazing and it's sitting there waiting to be opened and watched. But I have to probably, therefore, give it to... Uh, Top Gun. I mean, uh, Days of Thunder looks good. What a surprise! <laughs> yeah, Top Gun. So I, I, I mean, I, I you know, I, I, I love going back to those movies. I love watching a bit of it with the kids until they started swearing a bit too much, or in Days of Thunder's case, until the stripper came out. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah. yeah very... See, see, with these releases, Jaws, it was a no-brainer. I was going to buy that on release day. But normally for catalog titles, what I tend to do nowadays is wait a month or two uh, because what you'll find is and that's what i'm doing with these cruise movies uh, top gun and, yeah. and so on is if you wait a month or two the, the turn up in the two for 30 or three for 30 deal offers um and that's when i'll pick them up i'll pick them up then um yeah but yeah jaws was a like day one i was always going to buy that one yeah absolutely i i just i didn't know about the collector's edition if i'd known about that and i bought that because uh, i, I should just Point out because someone's asked in the thread. Um, I haven't had a chance yet to watch Lawrence of Arabia or Gandhi because neither of them are short movies. And it's <laughs> going to take a while. <laughs> yeah, that's a good. That's a good eight hours there. Yeah. Between a pair of them. Um, so I can't yeah. comment on picture quality yet because I haven't seen them. Right. I'm okay. saving those for when I got some time to really sit back and relax and enjoy them. I thought that's what you did most weeks. I think you had loads Ooh, of that. low blow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You've got to do these things. Right, uh, shall we answer some questions before we go into TV shows of the month? Um, I think there's a few to get through anyway. Um, I'll, I'll pick in quickly with, with Ken's comment, son of SJ. Bowie's uh, um, Glastonbury 2000 gig. I was there, Ken. I was actually there. I'm in the video. If you look at the oh, scene, I'm at the back. It is one of his best performances. It is absolutely superb. Um, but, uh, yeah, if you haven't seen Bowie at Glastonbury, he's amazing. Um I've already got it on DVD and on CD. Uh, okay. Right, okay. Uh, William Brown, he's donated £10. Thank you very much, William. Um, Thank you, sir. Thanks for the advice. Bought the 65-inch C9. Good good choice there. Yeah. Um, he's saying he's got the UB700 player. I'm assuming that that is a Panasonic. Um, is it worth upgrading to the 820 uh, to get Dolby Vision? Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Um, 
you you don't even need to go to the 820. I mean, the 820 has got some nice features on it. It's a it's the full size uh, units. So if you've got a, a a rack and you want a full size unit, then the 820 is good. Um, if you're nosy and you want to know what the uh, the disc was mastered at and so on, it is useful because you can double press the the user info and you can see net value and so on 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 the discs that you're watching. But if you don't need any of those nerdy things, then actually the 450, the UB 450, I think is about 160, 170 quid at the minute. Absolutely stonking bargain it does hdr 10 plus and dolby vision um and obviously audio through uh, hdmi if you want uh, good audio and you want to you know use the darks and everything else then there is the 9000 but to be honest with you i think the 450 is what you're looking for there um nigel henry lg c9 yeah uh, i've used the snm disc i I'm assuming that's Spears and Mansell and not Metallica's S and M disc. <laughs> or something even or something more niche. <laughs> I wasn't gonna go there, but thanks, lads. Uh yeah, so you're setting the contrast and brightness in SDR. I'm surprised reference little difference in values. There won't be any difference in values. The only difference between dark room and bright room is luminance, panel luminance. Um they are identical or they should be identical, other than that. Um Although now that you mentioned gamma, I think bright room is two point two and dark room and 2. is two point four. So 2.4 dark room, 2.2 bright room. That's the only difference. Everything else should be the same other than panel luminance as well because I think uh, bright room is uh, set for 150 nits and I think dark room set for 100 nits. Um, that's the only difference that you're going to get. So also, you shouldn't... if you're looking at the image and you're thinking one doesn't look much brighter than the other, don't forget, we've mentioned this before on the podcast, our eyes are terrible yeah. in terms of between two bright things. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, they should they should almost look identical. It's just ones for, obviously, brighter surroundings and so on. Um, technically, you really shouldn't be touching the contrast and brightness because nowadays, out of the box, most TVs yeah. are bang on. Um uh, some sets maybe crush black a tiny little bit. Um, LGs do that because they're trying to cover over the black flashing and some of the material, but um, certainly the and some, and some clip the whites and you drop down the contrast a couple of notches. But so. Yeah, yeah, you can do that. Uh, and some will be set to 255 white. Uh, some will be set to 235 white, so you've got to check that. But normally you don't have to mess about with them. And certainly with HDR, do not touch them. Um, apart from if you have a Samsung, uh, if you have a Samsung, you want to knock it down uh, four clicks on contrast just so it tracks PQ properly. Um, although I believe, I haven't seen a 2020 set yet, but Steve's seen two. Um, are they better out of the box for follow, following yes. PQ? Yeah. Yes, they seem that. Yes, they were tracking correctly without doing that this time. Right. So if you've got a, a 2019, 2018, 2017 Samsung, you need to knock it down four clicks on contrast in HDR for it to follow PQ properly. But you're probably not going to notice a difference. Um, four clicks on the contrast like Steve was saying we mentioned it before, you ain't going to notice a difference but um, what it will do is it'll bring back some uh, specular highlights that might be clipped otherwise um, Right, T-check certification meant something back in the day, licensed taxi man, yes it did, it still means something now, it's just that they don't do very much in terms of product certification i think that um possibly panasonic is the only manufacturer i can think of that is still dealing with thx unless steve's going to correct me on that one but i think it's only panasonic no, that's still, right. still doing uh, stuff. Still uh yeah parasound yeah from that side of things uh you could be right there ed um and certainly mk speakers mk yeah MK they are still um and there's a few other speaker brands there's uh, teufel which is a german company we don't get to see many teufel things over here now but uh we used to get things through for review from teufel uh, thx speaker packages and so on um have you tried ever tested tvs with home kit support regarding iphone ipad yes i i do that with the tvs because i'm i'm all apple here um so i tend to do bits and pieces with with stuff like that but um it's not something that tends to get asked for very often, but uh, certainly if it's if it's normally if there's an issue, we'll mention it in the review. Um, otherwise, it'll get a mention, and if we don't go into it in any other detail, it works fine. That's basically what we do with the reviews. You know, if it's <laughs> like we said earlier, if it's not worth mentioning, then we'll give it a quick mention and move on. Um, looking for some other questions here just before we move on. I think that's everything. I've actually. got one. Uh all right, go on. I, no, right. Um, uh, Kevin Davis asked, uh, getting a Denon 6700 AVR for my home theatre. I want to get a good stereo integrated amp. Uh, Kef R3s, name XS3 or regular illicit R have enough power? Uh, yes, in a word. Um, 
bear in mind that uh, whatever figure is quoted for AV receivers, it drops when they're all under under power. Um, the name is what listed at 70 watts, but trust me when I say that that will be more than sufficient to level match anything that the Denon can do under load. Uh, I've not actually ever tested a Rager Illicit R, but again, I don't remember it being, I, I don't recall it being short of grunt. Um, if you are genuinely concerned about this, there is an amp going through testing, well, it's been tested, I've written it, I just need to take photos of it, uh, which will be in the next clutch of reviews, uh, which is very much uh, roughly the same price as the name uh but disposes of a great deal more power so if you genuinely are concerned about this this could match the den on what for what even on its single channel loaded figures and it's very very good so that might be worth a look so just keep an eye out for that so yeah um don't don't get too hung up about it any of those either of those amps will do it uh, but if you are really wanting to match it perfectly with it there's something in the tank that you may want to read before you make a purchase decision Okay. Any questions, Steve? I'm, I'm uh, busy. Yeah, one from Sam Lloyd Gale. Uh, thanks for the JBL 9.1 bar review, Steve. Just a quick question. How far away from your seating position were the rears when you tested it? How far would you recommend? I like my rears to be just behind and to the sides of the listening position, um, ideally. And so I guess it was probably about two, they were about two feet from a sweet spot. They were fairly close. Um, but you could have put them further away than that. It's just that it was convenient for me to put them there. Um, so, you know, if you're going to put them four or five feet away, that won't be a problem. Okay. Uh, Phil saying Gemini Man, 60 hertz. Yeah, Steve went through this. Uh, you actually reviewed it a, a few podcasts back. I think it was still an audio podcast back then, Steve. Um, weird experience compared to 24 hertz. Yeah, obviously. Um, but level of detail was amazing. Yes. Um, so, f obviously, fast frame rate. Um, what you're talking about there is that you're actually talking about captured frames. Um, so the detail is captured. Um, motion is going to look superb. It's just it's not going to look film-like. And the issue is that for sports and so on, and we've had this conversation a few times on the podcast now, but for sports and, and other things, uh, fast frame rate, uh, yeah, great. Uh, bring it on. I'm I'm all for it, especially for sports like football, NFL, um, all that kind of thing, even golf. I mean, watching even watching nowadays on golf, you know, the golf ball disappearing or suddenly in different places all over the screen because, uh, you know, you're not watching the fast enough frame rate and so on. Yeah, for sports and that kind of thing, I'm all for it. But there's just something about 24 hertz or 24 frames per second. And yes, it was originally done to save costs and it was the cheapest way of um, making films where the audio would sync and your eyes wouldn't see the flicker of moving images. But what has happened because of that is it's given it an artistic look. It's given it a, a dreamlike look, uh, a different way of moving uh, the camera and moving the frame. And motion blur is part of that. And as soon as you take the motion blur away, which is what you do with 60 frames per second or 120 frames per second, it no longer looks like film. And this is where I think it gets generational as well. There'll be differences with people who play video games that maybe don't think it's that big a jump. But certainly, I'm not going to speak for Kaz, Tom or Steve, but for me, I can notice a different frame rate from 24 frames per second as soon as you start the film. And I've just been testing the, obviously, the Panasonic here, which is fine. It does 5.5 pull down properly. Uh, no interpolation added in the background or anything else. But LG did a couple of things with True Motion this year on their TVs, which I was testing. One of them is Cinema Clear, and it's supposed to work without adding in soap opera effect. It doesn't work. You can tell it's You can tell. It's not as egregious away. or... I think for most people, it wouldn't be as egregious. I, I knew instantly it was being processed. Yeah, yeah. But I can yeah. see why some people would like it because it's not quite as obvious as some other. It's, not, it's not quite as obvious, but if, if you've got an eye for 24 frames per second, you're going to see it straight away. And the other thing, uh, black frame insertion on the LG as well, it was interpolating. Even if you switched both of the D judder and D blur down to zero, it was, and I can pick up on that straight away. And, and most people who are interested in 24 frames per second or film and watch film all the time, you'll notice it straight away. So it's an experiment. You'll notice that there's not a lot of these experiments happening now. There, there were only a couple of people really pushing it um, in Hollywood because the rest of the filmmaking community do not like it. Um, they have eyes. Yep, basically. <laughs> and, and like I say, it gives it a certain... Uh, movement that that's that gives it a, a certain look and that's what they're going for it's an aesthetic um son of sj is asking a question for me strangely okay 
Go on. Um, what percentage of discs for which the 1080p Blu-ray is already pretty good? Is it worth upgrading to the 4K Blu-ray? Uh, and he gives examples of The Matrix. Yes, but not Oblivion. Now, uh, interestingly, one of our regular forum um, patrons, uh, Cos, uh, answered this, I think, pretty much perfectly for me, which is that uh, Blu-ray did the upgrade from DVD uh, something like 90 percent you know it's a, a, a massive difference for a lot of people uh, and the upgrade from blu-ray to 4k it can be just a small amount to get to that perfection it just depends whether or not you want that if you're talking about resolution uh, yeah if you're talking about resolution and uh, i think it's the hdr that is the is the cream for a lot of people. And it's whether or not you like that. I mean, by all accounts, the new Jaws disc looks great. I've never seen Top Gun look this good. I was wowed by it before. And some discs might not be as much of a wow. And, and, and but... again, I want to caveat this one, Kaz, if I can, because I think this is where having a... a I don't want this to sound elitist in any way because it's not meant that way, but there are different levels of HDR TVs out there in the market. Yeah. And sure. yeah. to see HDR properly, um, you need to, you really need to have a TV that at least hits 600 nits, a peak brightness, and that tone maps properly, um, yes. and at least has Dolby Vision on board because Dolby Vision can tone map to the capabilities of the TV. That makes a huge difference as yes. well. And um, I guess as, as for some people with perhaps the projector kit, which doesn't does the other things differently maybe the difference is is not not quite as significant yeah yeah there's, so there's, it's not just a resolution thing is kind yeah. of what i was trying to say there um, yeah for sure for yeah, sure the, the color gamut could often be quite impressive yeah, yeah absolutely i, I think, think la la land last night and i've forgotten just how much those i mean i do it mm. to make it look like technicolor but yes. the colors really pop in hdr which they I, just wouldn't they don't do in blu-ray Yes, yeah. so I, I would say the same level. there isn't, I don't think there's a 4K release that I've ever been disappointed by. Uh, more often than not, they've been 4K discs where it's given the film a new lease of life for me. You know, whether it's a modern release or more often than not, I have to say some of my favourite have been these Studio Canal discs where they take a film you wouldn't expect, stick Dolby Vision on it and give it a really nice 4K <laughs> makeover. Yeah, it's it's they've been pretty special. You know, I never thought I'd see Angel Heart that way. Um, yeah, that so incredible. so so I, I think that I think that it's it's been a, a very pleasant surprise in some cases. And I don't think I've come across something disappointing. I know it's not the leap that people get from the days of really soft DVD to, to pin sharp Blu-ray. I get it. But um, but I, I, I haven't been disappointed by any. And and also, you know, a two K DI to four K. Um, again, people seem to assume that when it's upscaled, it's upscaled the same way as a TV would upscale it. It's not. Yeah. There's a lot of care goes into uh, you know putting a two K DI into a four K disc, and of course, it gets regraded as well, um, which can make a big difference. So you've got to remember these things as well, and don't just write off that. Oh well, it's just an upscale. No, there's a lot yes. more goes into it than just an upscale. You know, oh, there, there are other things there. You know, John Wick 2 looks better than John Wick 1. Um, <laughs> you know, it's a yeah. fantastic looking disc. Basically, if you put on the Blu-ray, then put on the, or rather put on the 4K disc first in HDR, and then put on the Blu-ray, it just looks insipid and dull in mm -hmm. comparison. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's usually quite shocking when you do a side-by-side -side comparison. Someone, uh, Gustavo has asked about Dolby Vision versus HDR 10 Plus, fell, I'll let you answer that because you did a comparison, didn't you? Yeah, I did a comparison. I was actually surprised just how much a difference there actually was. And and I did it on a 55-inch Panasonic and a 65-inch Panasonic. Um, and I had two different players, um, and I had to try and sync them up. And then I swapped them over so there wasn't any... Uh, bias between the 55 and the 65, whether it was uh, Dolby Vision or HDR10 Plus. HDR10 Plus blew everything out. Um, it's very much like HDR10. In fact, I couldn't really tell the difference between the HDR10 tone map and the um, HDR10 Plus. There was very little in it, to be honest. Whereas with Dolby Vision, um, it manages to keep the brighter specular highlights without dulling the image too much. And, and when you look at how certain TVs will tone map, something like a Sony, what it tends to do is it tends to go for keeping the 
speculate highlights there so you can see them. But what that then happens is it dulls the rest of the image down. And they have changed it for the 1920 sets where they've added a bit more tone mapping in there, so it doesn't get quite as dull overall. But but yeah, Dolby Vision for me, um, because it's done from beginning to end through the whole process, um, it's it's dynamic metadata and it's working to the capabilities of that TV. Um, it just works so much better than HDR10 plus, um, in my opinion, having done side by side tests using roughly the same TVs and, and equipment and swapping them over. And, and these are calibrated as well. So, um, so yeah, um, for me, HDR10 plus is not in the same league when it comes to dynamic tone mapping and, and tone mapping as, as Dolby Vision. So, um, that was the results of my testing, which I did last year. Um, and obviously HDR10 plus, I haven't noticed as many discs this year coming with with that format. So um, I think the only company that were doing it was it Fox, and then Fox got bought out by Disney. Yeah, they're Disney. Disney now. So I think Fox were the only ones really pushing um, um, HDR10 Warners plus. Warners have started using it, they, but they offer both, right. Dolby Vision and HDR10 plus usually, and and uh, Universal have been using it a bit as well. But uh, it hasn't really gained much traction. I mean, and Vision, Dolby Vision is pretty dominant at this point. I mean, yep. all the stream, all the streamers use it apart from Amazon. Um, Although so, you say that, it's, some stuff I've seen on Amazon has popped there's up. There's a bit of Amazon stuff in Vision. Vision as well, yeah. like uh, Jack Ryan's in Vision. Or well, first, sorry, the first season of Jack Ryan's in Vision. The second season is HDR10+. So. Right, yeah. So I hope that answers uh, your question. Who was that again? Was it Gus Gustavo. Uh, yeah, Gustavo, I hope that answers your question for you. And again, I'm I'm going to try and do some a bit more testing because it, yeah, it, everything's in flux with HDR because, like I say, um, it comes down to tone mapping and how manufacturers are doing that. And as the years have gone on, manufacturers are getting so good now with their tone mapping algorithms that um, you know sometimes the HDR10 plus uh, HDR just the base layer HDR10. Um, can look just as good as a dynamic metadata version um, with the tone mapping that some of these companies are, are introducing now. Um, and of course, projector wise, it's getting better as well. JVC's, uh, you know, their frame adapt stuff is, is it's almost yeah. like dynamic metadata HDR. It really is good. And for a projector, that's, that's really something because projectors are really, really difficult to, uh, um, to do HDR. Right. So let's move on. Um, TV shows, of the month, what have been our favourites? I'm going to be quick here. Ain't watched any TV, so I can't take uh, can't take part in this. So let's move to our newest member of the podcast, Tom. What have you been watching? Uh, the new series of What We Do in the Shadows has just that hit be iPlayer. <laughs> oh man, it's brilliant! They clearly yeah. have absolutely no problem enticing top Hollywood talent in to do whatever they want them to do, and it's it just works um obviously matt berry is good to watch in anything, <laughs> anything. <laughs> <He's brilliant. laughs> um yeah it's it's just hit the nail on the head straight away in the way that the first series kind of took a few episodes to ramp up to kind of find its groove but this has just hit the ground running and it's hilarious good yeah mine too so i'm <laughs> with tom okay kaz uh, I'll go with the third season of Sinner, which uh, I really enjoyed. I, I loved the last two, which I watched pretty much back to back because I didn't get into it until quite late on. Uh, and I've enjoyed the different direction of the third. I think uh, Bill Pullman's a great modern day Columbo. Uh, he's got, he's, I've got a, got a lot of time for him. Just one okay. more thing. <laughs> Ed? Uh, I've barely watched any television, Phil, let's be honest here. Um, <laughs> periodically, I turn it on to amuse my son. Uh, periodically, I turn it on to remind myself it works. Um, uh, no, I haven't watched anything new. I mean, I've, I'm getting around to watching episodes of The Orville. I didn't get around to watching the last time. Oh, so that's that's where we are. Um, uh, so Orville. Best Star Simpsons. Trek series. Barn. Yes. Uh, the only thing that was quite amusing, <laughs> there was a fascinating thing in the uh, in, uh, on the Wikipedia entry for Orville where it did it, it very carefully and with excruciating precision ran through the disconnect between critics reviews of the first season uh, who were all raving over Star Trek and actual audience reaction. Um, and it's like, well, 
you know, the critics hated it because tonally all of your episodes are very variable. Some of them are... Um, in, the, in the second season, it's a lot less overtly comedic. Yeah, and, but and even... more so, of just basically a next generation. Yeah, <laughs> so, um, but nevertheless, it's, um, I, you know, it, it, it just, it, it's a, it was amusing to see the disconnects. And it's like the second season, as you say, sort of evens things out a bit. Um, and, Although uh, there's still there's still knob jokes and fat jokes and stuff in there, so there's still toilet humour, but not no, quite actually. as much as the end, first season. Yeah, I not totally. Yeah. It balances out a bit more. Yeah. Um, but no, otherwise I've watched barely anything. Uh, there's music, endless music. That's what we yeah. do. I mean, some people might be questioning, Phil. You haven't watched any TV, but you're reviewing TVs. That's because we watch the same shite over and over and over again. <laughs> it's the same film clips. It's the same bits of pieces. So, yeah. And apart from that, I've been watching football because football's back, and um, for some reason, I've I've been enjoying watching With it. So, I think somebody won the the. Uh, the league and unfortunately Mark's not here so <laughs> I think that, that I think they are missing a trick with the soundtrack options that I would like one person making the noise so you have you could have silence or you could have artificial crowd noise or you could just have one person who maybe didn't have a full idea of what's going on just making a lot of rash, random irrational noise Man, <laughs> I, would, I want to I volunteer would... for that job I could do that <laughs> yeah well I mean I say it's, you know it wasn't Ooh, the whole purpose kick with, the ball wasn't the whole purpose of um uh, there's always talk years ago about AC4 where we could have dozens of different soundtrack options. Surely yeah, this yeah. was the time for AC4. I, I wish they would bring AC4. Well, AC4 is there. They're just not using it, uh, not utilising it. But, yeah, it, it was so funny, that demo that we had as well. I think it was basketball. We could hear it in Spanish and, and all yeah, different just, languages. I and want it. Spanish all the time in my yeah. country. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, uh, I was thinking about the crowd noise, and it's like the Sky Sports when they do the uh, the Scottish Premier League crowds, because they've always make up the crowds, and of course you know what the Scots are like <laughs> when it comes to language. And it's I'm missing that aspect of it. I'm missing the boo boo <laughs> with the F word in between there. Yes. Um, <laughs> Uh, so no, I, I completely agree. There, there's there's a number of options being missed, and I also like the person on Twitter that said another option should be instead of the sort of modern EA crowd noise, it should just be the sort of hiss from Sensible World of Soccer from the nineties. <laughs> um, you know, which um, again, it's just all of these things. Come on, technology to the rescue, um, but alas, not to be. And um, uh, there's also just just to, to to piss on everyone's chips. It does. It, there's still juries out on whether the opening games next season are going to be played in front of a crowd. Yeah. So see where we go from there. Yeah, but I mean the Premiership will survive because obviously the TV money and stuff. But um, I really fear for lower leagues and like I just said, Scottish Premier, they're having to cut wages and all sorts because if they don't have crowds coming in, they ain't got TV money coming in and, you know, could really impact bad, quite badly on the sport, to be honest. So, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it is a bit worrying from that aspect. Anyway, we move on to our final discussion. I said we're going to be finished by half eight. We failed. Hooray! Well, if no. we just shout out our best and worst Sigourney films, we could get in three Closer than... We we're pretty close. We can get through this fast. Yeah, yeah, course. okay, okay. We'll get we'll get <laughs> through it how fast. fast we can do it. <laughs> right. Okay. So uh, let's move from. Uh, I need to see who's left. Right. Our oh, left is Steve. So Steve, on you go. Uh, best of book. Okay. Um, obviously, Alien. Aliens. That's a given. Um, it's a good and working girl. Ghostbusters. Galaxy Quest. Uh, I'm so, yeah. Sorry, I was going to say I'm that. Going, yeah. Going through it. In, uh, <laughs> yeah, Galaxy Quest uh, and. Um, I, I, of recent Sigourney Weaver stuff, I, I really uh, thought she was excellent in A Monster Calls. Yes, I was going to say that. I'd like special mention for that because that is a powerful movie. Bot on English accent. I didn't realise her mother was English. Yeah. She's actually half English. So oh. She just basically did a mum's accent for the film. <laughs> Pulp Fiction. No, I know she wasn't in Pulp Fiction, but Pulp Fiction just done 80, 20 quid. Um, oh. Thank you very much. <laughs> that really is, uh, that really, really is appreciated. Me briefly, yeah. <laughs> excellent film, excellent yeah. person. Yeah. Was yeah. she the gimp? Yeah. So um, thank you very much. 20 pounds donated there. Um, that really is appreciated. Thank you. I just, it was worth coming in at that point. I knew it would confuse the guys if I mentioned Pulp Fiction. So there you go. <laughs> right. Uh, who's next? Uh, I'm going to skip. So Ed, you're next. Well, I say, uh, if we take the uh, alien aliens as just magnificent, I do, just the the play the the, the send up of that female role 
in Galaxy Quest is perfect. Yeah. And just the point where she's overdubbed, just deliberately <laughs> and hilariously, you know, screw that. And she's clearly saying something. Well, that is because they filmed it with more, more, so we say, fruity language. And then they were told to make it a PG. But so I, the fact sorts. that it's still there just looks fantastic. So obvious. It's yeah. absolutely um, fantastic. I assume the, that the was more... a, an absolute a, a conscious gag. No, the more no, was, you see was, that was, film, the more I think it is absolutely genius. It's a modern classic. It really is. Well, uh, David Mamet said it was one of the four perfect films ever made, and that includes The Godfather. Who said that? Uh, David, David Mamet, Mamet, playwright. Yeah. He said it was, one of, it was a perfect film. <laughs> I mean, just, I mean, obviously, it, it's one, another, yet another film where you watch it and you, you miss Alan Rickman every day. But yep. nevertheless, I mean, just that, I mean, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what a savings. It's just <laughs> by Grandpa's Hammer. <laughs> <laughs> Just fa- fabulous. But then he also managed, he sells the line for real at the end. Yes, yeah, that's yeah. because it's Alan Bloody that Rickman. Is class yeah. acting, it really is. <laughs> He's, nice. It's just, it's got, but no, she's she's fantastic in that. Um, and, and I've got to say, very saucy too, isn't it? Yeah, the <laughs> costume works for her. <laughs> it's amazing what you can do with a wonder bra, and a blonde wig. Yeah, to be fantastic. fair, um, I'm trying to say, I haven't actually watched that many other things that she's in. Which is a terrible thing to say, but I don't watch that many films, as you know. I mean, you know, they're they're, they're long and they get in the way of me pottering around and going to the loo every fifteen minutes. Licensed so. taxi man says he actually had uh, Mr. Rickman in his taxi some years ago. Well, there you go. As long as he was still alive at that point, I mean, this isn't <laughs> really unpleasant story. Dark. But no. Dark. yeah. I mean, obviously, just going back to Galaxy Quest, the point, the other thing that's absolutely brilliant is obviously when his rubber you know, prosthesis starts to start coming apart. It's just <laughs> tufts of hair coming out. And I, it's, that's I, just fantastic. I think I mentioned it last week, but goes, Now TV have got um, Never Never Surrender, the making the thing about uh, the mm. documentary about Galaxy Quest on there. So oh, watch. I didn't know that. It's on Sky Documentaries. It's absolutely superb. Um, well, good. Um, uh, but no, other than that, I haven't watched a huge amount else that she's um, she's in. So, sorry, well, it's my contribution to these things, but I would agree. Over, over to the film expert. No, I would agree. Licensed <laughs> Axman did point out that she was in The Village, which I do remember seeing, uh, and um, uh, that was that was complete shite. Mm. So, um, yeah, that's that would be a fair work, low point, wouldn't it? Licensed Axman said he did pay, so he was alive. <laughs> fair enough. I say, I say Alien Resurrection was a low point for Sigourney Weaver. But, yeah. but she doesn't do a lot of crap, to be honest. Looking at her filmography, she she tends to pick decent material most of the she's time. She's pretty ripped in Alien Resurrection. It's, uh, yeah, but it's not great films. Her... No, but it's pretty impressive. But she does that basketball oh, trick yeah. for real. Yeah, it's pretty... Uh... <laughs> yeah, but how many takes? It's all very well saying... <laughs> yeah, on, I don't take know, 146. <laughs> it's, still, it's still impressive when you see... Because annoyingly, in, in the film, the, ball, the basketball goes out of frame yes. before it drops in. And you're assuming she just threw it in the air and someone caught it in the gantry and then dropped the ball down. In the, but no, they do another take where you can see it from another camera and it's, it's for real. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, if you think about her in the other Alien films and then in Alien Resurrection, I know... It's her character who's been spliced with an alien, but she's done. She does pretty well to 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 be to come across like Ripley on steroids. Yeah, um, but you I would say, say it's not a great film. But she's she's not bad in it. <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. I think oh. um, I think Alien and Aliens, uh, and I I do like her in Alien Three. I have to say, yeah, it's a great yeah. film, but she yeah. commits to it. Completely. Yeah, uh, Gorillas in the Mist. She's, she, you know, she. There are a few other films she's made where, where she leads the charge. I actually quite like Copycat. It's been years since I've seen it, but um, she's, but she's, she's very funny in Heartbreakers. Yeah, time. Heartbreakers. Galaxy she's Quest. really good in that. <laughs> uh, but it, but uh, but then you do, you know, she was in Ghostbusters twenty sixteen. Well, I mean, let's face it, no one well, else out of that. Mm-hmm. Good. Yeah, but she was she was in the original two as well, though. I did like I know, her. Um, I did like her. It's almost a cameo, but her role in Cabin in the Woods is quite yeah. good as well. Yeah. That's that's solid. I gotta say, I don't think she dials it in. She's she, she's she doesn't phone it in. If you look, even in the film she's in, they're necessarily good. She's good. Yes. Yeah. I, I thought I thought the uh, the reveal in uh, Paul was really quite quite entertaining, and the way that she just went to absolutely went to town on that was was really good. 
I've never seen it, so thanks. I don't, um, I don't think I had a great deal of time for Red Lights or Cold Light of Day. Those were two uh, films with the word light in the title that she did back to back, which didn't work for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bad year, 2012. That was Robert De Niro was Red Lights, I think. Uh, that was yeah, a not bad year for him, film. too. That was a bad year for him. But he doesn't she, have she, that many good ones. Yeah, anymore. she wasn't great. And Cold Light of Day was, I think, Bruce Willis as well. Uh, so, Well, he, yeah. he has, I mean, he's taken yeah. phoning it into an entire new level. Yes, of not so I think... Giving two shiny shits yeah, so. the, the answer for scorny weaver is don't do films with de niro or bruce willis post 2010 stick with jim and camera and you'll be all right yeah <laughs> yeah go, go blue, go blue. Out, okay <laughs> well she's doing the, two, the next two isn't she yeah somehow oh, spoiler alert <laughs> didn't she die spoiler alert yeah, in yeah, Avatar. Exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah. did she oh <laughs> well, maybe not if she's in the sequel <laughs> yeah well, I think we've we've kind of gotten to the fact where uh, yeah, this is the matter because uh, Brent Spiner he died in the original Independence Day. Yeah, he's back uh, in he the, a bad in the neck, but he was a, he was a bad neck. A right. Bad he neck. Bad his head was on neck. the wrong way round for <laughs> Christ's sake. <laughs> yeah, right. that was the least of that sequel's problem. Yeah, that was, yeah, that was the least yeah, problem was... from that sequel. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I think I think, uh, I think we've got to get a couple of honourable mentions for. Sigourney Weaver in as well because um, starting a career in Annie Hall as one of uh, Woody Allen's exasperated dates that's yeah. a really nice it was really nice uh, and escaping sp- from yes <laughs> yeah yeah exasperated dates these days means something very different when it comes to Woody Allen Woody Allen yes I yes I oh, they, they might have done back then as let's, well let's let's leave that that's that's another podcast for another, yeah, yeah. So let's leave that there. <laughs> Um, no, yeah, that, that's another podcast with a lawyer sitting in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but in terms of bad Sigourney Weaver stuff, Exodus, Gods and Kings, am I the only person who thought that movie was utter tripe? You may be never seen it. Forgot she was in it. <laughs> oh, she is. She's the the mother of what's his name? That man. Um, the, the you know the one who wasn't Egyptian. Who, who was the person who wasn't Egyptian in Exodus Gods and I Kings? I don't know, because I, I looked at the trailer, I thought mm. that looked like a bag of shite, and you never went anywhere near it. You, it, you it, was, it was a stinker. I mean, the very she least... was not good in it, and I think she was phoning it in. She was doing just standard, you know, business just bitch. Just doing really a favour or something. It was just... It was a ast- Joel Edgerton. That's who the man was that I was trying to. <laughs> he's the Egyptian, the not Egyptian. The not Egyptian. Yeah, well, like a Egyptian. not Egyptian. He's the Pharaoh, isn't he? <laughs> I think the not Egyptian is Moses, and that was no, Christian Bale. Everyone in Exit is the not Egyptian. Oh, I see. I mean, as in, <laughs> as in the actor's not Egyptian. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah no um, one in it was actually Egyptian. Yeah, but everyone was nicely tanned, so it was okay. <laughs> so oh, that's... Joel, Joel was gold, wasn't he? He was gold. Yes, yeah, he yeah. was painted gold, yeah. You looked really camp in that movie. That, I, suppose, yeah. I suppose being covered in gold paint, you're going to look camp. Hey, yeah. Anyway, I think uh, we've, kind of, <laughs> I think we've you know, new got depths. to the point where uh, you know, we've, we've discussed Sigourney Weaver and we've probably come to the end of the podcast within time as well because we've only done 102 minutes, which is, which is good for this, uh, for this podcast at this time. Anyway, I need to say thanks to Ken, son of SJ. He's donated three pounds. Ken, thank you very yep, much. Thank you. Um, Ken said uh, thank you for answering these questions. You're more than welcome, Ken. Uh, any time. Any time we can read them, we're good yeah. for it. For whatever just make reason, sure they, they are in, in there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but that's it for the podcast this week. So my thanks to Steve Withers. Boring conversation, anyway. Ed Selly. How much can I learn from an ass? Kaz Harlow. Yes, I've eaten many people. And Tom Davies. Well, I'm not going to eat a dead bird, am I? If you enjoyed the podcast, please give it a like and subscribe with the notification bell on our YouTube channel, and don't miss when we publish our next live stream or video reviews. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. You can bookmark avforums.com for the latest reviews, news, and videos. I'm not reading this out. Plus, why not leave us a five-star rating on iTunes, but only if you enjoyed the show. I'm Phil Hinton. Thank you very much for watching and listening, and we'll see you again next week.